Welcome to Daybreak Australia. I'm Heidi Stradwatts in Sydney, where markets have just come online. I'm Annabelle Drawlers in Hong Kong. We're counting down to Asia's major trading opens and the top stories this hour. Caution returns to markets with Treasuries under renewed pressure as strong economic data stokes fears that inflation is not yet tamed. China is said to be tightening trading restrictions on some domestic investors and offshore units in the fight to stem the deepening stock rounds. And the RBA widely expected to hold rates at a 12-year high later Tuesday, with investors set to focus on updated quarterly forecasts. Take a look at how we're setting up. A uh, pretty of a muted start to the start of trading here in Australia. We're expecting a little bit more downside there uh, with really futures suggesting that we're not going to see much in the way of either direction. Of course, it is RBA decision day, the first meeting of the year and also the first under this new revamped regime, right? We had the meeting kicking off on Monday. The decision is expected at 2.30 local time here in Sydney, uh, followed by that press conference as well as updated forecasts. And we'll be really zeroing in given expectations uh, are that rates will stay on hold at that 12-year high. We will be seeing that extra scrutiny on the future path of rate policy under this new communications regime as well. So taking a look at how we're uh, faring when it comes to Australian bonds in particular, sovereign bonds and following those losses that we saw overnight in Treasuries, that strong US ISM data following uh, Chair Powell's more hawkishly interpreted comments and of course this recent kind of spate of weak growth and price data, inflation undershooting RBA inspections really kind of uh, set up these expectations for the day. Take a look at how we're faring when it comes to the setup. A little bit of weakness there expected as we get into the side of trading in Tokyo uh, and Seoul in the next hour. About a quarter of 1% softer with Nikkei futures trading in Chicago. Dot yen is holding pretty steady at that 148 level. Uh, and of course, uh, not much respite when it comes to China, but at least uh, A50 China futures are modestly in the green bell. <laughs> Take the wins where we can get them. But uh, you mentioned, of course, the, the moves that we had in Treasuries overnight, and that is really the focus this morning here. I want to just put it in more context, more perspective. Uh, you think about where we were a few weeks ago, because just about a month ago, the, the market expectation for the March meeting from the Fed, it was a near certainty that we were going to be seeing a cut. Today, those odds are around 10%. And that is what's driven the huge moves in the bond space, that recalibration around when the Fed would start to cut. So Klanovich, for instance, is saying that the markets are just way too ahead of themselves here. And that has been playing into the trading dynamic quite substantially. You saw all yields moving higher across the curve, some as much as 15 basis points in the prior session. Equity is a little bit under pressure, but you're continuing to see uh, the S&P 500 within reach of that 5,000 mark. Stocks futures right now are fairly flat to start the day. But the focus, of course, really coming down to China because uh, the moves that round continue Continuing. Now we're getting these more steps coming through. So sources telling us that uh, Beijing is looking to tra tighten trading restrictions on domestic institutional investors. Uh, could also be for some offshore units. So let's get more on this now. Our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, joining us. Again, is this something substantial or is it just sort of another Band-Aid solution? Yeah, a bit of a piecemeal approach. But keep in mind, uh, you know, uh, there's been a number of different factors at play here. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, perhaps the national team coming in uh, cross-border and propping up stocks after the midday break. Uh, and you've seen that now in eight out of the last 10 sessions. Uh, but small caps have been absolutely pummeled. I think we talked about it a lot yesterday, where the CSI 1000 index falling another 6%. Uh, so there's kind of two main things that I can talk about right now. Uh, one, we, we're seeing the national team perhaps uh, coming in uh, through some of these directives as well that are coming through securities regulators and the like. Uh, there's this chart just saying basically the nine-year lows in sight coming you know, we already saw a five-year low uh, for the CSI 300 mm. on Friday. But I want to change the terminal page. Let's start with this in the first place. And I'll get to some of the, the piecemeal approaches and, and regulatory moves that we're hearing about in just a second. But here, look at this northbound Stock Connect flows. Five straight days right there. We're seeing uh, intraday rebounds have started coinciding more with buying by offshore participants through the trading link with Hong Kong northbound. Eight of the past ten sessions have seen inflows into mainland shares from the north 
earthbound program. Um, one of those days, the CSI 300 index saw intraday rebounds just as the northbound flows started turning around. So and it's not a coincidence. And, and market participants are saying, are saying perhaps this is the national team, which would right. perhaps be uh, funds uh, being uh, you know, directed from overseas units mm -hmm. of state-owned enterprises uh, being encouraged to invest. And that goes oftentimes into the big caps. So that's why we saw the CSI 300 uh, in the afternoon actually end with a Gain. But the CSI 1000, we can bring up, there's, there's, there yeah, it is right there. Wow. Producers <laughs> are on their game this morning. Um, you can see year to date, of course, uh, it's down nearly 30%. And this is where a lot of this social unrest is kind of starting to mm. bubble up, where people are saying it's a casino. It's it's absolutely, uh, you know, devastating, uh, especially as the nation heads towards the uh, Lunar New Year holiday. Not very optimistic. So here... To answer your question at the top, let me read through some of these bullet points, what we're hearing from sources. Authorities are imposing caps on some brokerages, cross-border total return swaps with clients. Essentially, uh, that limits a way for China-based investors to short Hong Kong stocks. So that's going the other direction. And Hong Kong, obviously, uh, the Hang Seng Index at, uh, is down 9% so far this year. At the same time, some Chinese brokerages that use the channel to buy mainland shares for their offshore units have been told not to reduce their positions okay so that also goes in line with the national team buying and then you cannot also reduce your positions now here's where we get interesting quant hedge funds meanwhile they've been banned from placing sell orders completely as of yesterday while others were barred from cutting stock positions in their leveraged market neutral funds this is called a direct market access strategy it's believed to have exacerbated uh, the route in those short uh, or small cap stocks mm -hmm. in China so again CSRC has been out with a bunch of uh, directives including a press uh, statement on Sunday saying it has found evidence of malicious short selling and other abnormal behavior they're trying to crack down on that mm -hmm. Our Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Angle there with the latest and his uh, incremental steps. And of course, turning to our other big story of the day, the Reserve Bank of, uh, here in Australia widely expected to hold interest rates at a 12 year high, maintain that generally hawkish stance against still elevated inflation. This is the first decision of the year and also the first under uh, the revamped communication strategy. Let's bring our economics reporter, Swati Pandey, for more. And I think, you know, you were saying you'll be glad when the day is over. There's been a lot of anticipation in this first meeting under the new regime. Yes, so it's been two months that we've heard from the Reserve Bank, and now we are going to hear them in from them in a new structure. Uh, they are also going to be releasing the quarterly forecasts uh, along with the rate decision, which is new. It did not happen like that earlier. They would release three days later. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of information that we are going to get from the RBA. Uh, expectation is that they will uh, revise downwards their inflation forecasts. And and maybe drop their tightening bias or maybe just kind of soften that tightening bias uh, like the U.S. Federal Reserve has done. But that is a big question, uh, whether they continue to say that further tightening is still needed or whether they kind of remove that sentence. That is what uh, investors will be closely looking at. Mm. Yeah, so the RBA, is, it, we know it's putting in place some sort of recommendations of an independent review that did find shortcomings in its communication and decision-making style. So what's changed exactly? Um, so they are going to be doing fewer meetings now. So they used to do monthly meetings barring January, so 11 in a year. Now they are going to do once in six months, so that will be eight meetings a year. Meetings are also going to be longer, so instead of a one-day meeting, it's going to be a two-day meeting. So this particular one started yesterday, and the rate decision will be announced today. Uh, they are also going to be releasing the quarterly forecast at the same time, uh, like I said earlier, which was not the case before and there's going to be a press conference from Governor Michelle Bullock after every single meeting so eight press conferences and also the statement earlier used to be written by the governor signed off by the governor uh, from today onwards it's going to be the statement from the board not just from the governor and that's because um, to broaden the accountability so it's not just the governor who's taking the decision alone it's the board decision
Yeah, big question, of course, is whether we do hear them pushing back on those bets for any sort of cuts. But that was our economics reporter, Swati Pandey, there in Sydney. And you can also turn to your Bloomberg for more on this. Go to T-Life, go to get commentary and analysis from Bloomberg's expert editors. That decision coming up later today in uh, Sydney. Up next, we'll hear from Alfinity Investment Management on why they're cautious on China and the EV sector. This is Bloomberg. It feels like the economy's been quite strong on the growth front. You got big jobs numbers, you got big GDP numbers better than expected. But at the same time, we've had inflation better than expected too. If we just keep getting more data like what we have gotten, we're well on the, uh, I believe that we should be well be on the path to normalization. Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee there speaking with us exclusively about the need to see more good inflation data before the Fed commits to cutting interest rates. Joining us now in Sydney is Alfredo Yonko, who's a client portfolio manager and investment specialist at Alfinity Investment Management. Alfredo, great to see you in the new year. And, you know, policy error is always top of mind, isn't it, as you say, because even yeah. as we've seen the market reprice, still expectations are for, are for five cuts. I guess mm. it's down to timing, but what's the risk here? Yes, I think if you look at where we've come from last year, um, the market was expecting six cuts this year. We are now down to below 20% probability of a cut in March, and even the cut in May has dropped down to a 60% probability. So I guess the, the risks are that the market is just looking for too many cuts, and at the end of the day, the data might be too strong, or there's a risk that inflation could flare up, flare up again, and you won't see those sort of level of cuts that the market's sort of pricing in already. And that uncertainty, and as you say, there's geopolitical and domestic political uncertainty overlaid yes. over the fact that, you know, we're already trading in a market where multiples are not low and yes. earnings are not fabulous, right? So where are you finding opportunities? Yes, I completely agree with you. As we entered this year, S&P 500 sitting at around 20 times PE, which is quite lofty. Mm. And I think the, the key risk probably, if you look at last year, a majority of those returns were really driven by multiple expansion and not earnings growth. So even now in the fourth quarter earnings season, we're seeing quite tepid earnings growth. Um, overall, the market of the stocks that's reported, we're probably close to the 50% mark. The earnings growth is only sitting at around 3%. Um, the market wasn't expecting much. But I guess what the market is looking for is a big inflection into the fourth quarter of around 19% earnings growth uh, for the S&P. And that looks uh, pretty punchy. So um, we continue to look at some of those sort of mega trends from last year, uh, but we continue to look further afield within those trends rather than just the sort of mag seven um, for AI, for example. Yeah, and, and I suppose the hard thing is that tech earnings have come out pretty strong. Yes. Companies that are talking about AI are still doing well. Is, yes. that, is that a pocket that you're still looking into? Yes, I think we, we believe that is a multi decade trend um, and we really just in the infancy. I guess what you normally see in these sort of environments where um, you have a new tech evolution, at the start of that evolution you have the enablers. So the companies that give you the infrastructure and the ability to implement that. And then later on, as we evolve, we continue to see other beneficiaries throughout that whole ecosystem. And that is really where we're looking now is to see what companies across a number of different sectors can benefit from this trend with the services and products that they provide. Mm. So, um, yes, yes, so I can mention maybe a few names. Um, so something like um, a Prologis, for example, they um, an industrial REIT, but they're also um, benefiting currently from a lot of peers not building um, warehouses and of course also the need for more data centers. So what they're doing a lot in data centers um, as well as solar, which we believe is this next leg of growth for a company like that. So that's just one example of looking further afield. Which areas are you not uh, as positive on though? Because I think EVs, for instance, is, is one that's been highlighted. 
Yes, I think there are a few pockets of, of concern for us. I think uh, China still won, um, very low growth and companies reporting um, pretty disappointing results there during this specific quarter. So yes, EVs in particular, what we are seeing there is clearly Tesla has fallen out of the max seven and is guiding to a lot of cost pressures as well as slower sales. Um, so that is one stock that we don't own, but also across the broader spectrum. If you look at that EV sort of um, whole chain of companies in the vehicle space, a number of the big makers are saying that they are reducing the number of EVs they're planning to, to make and also pricing seems to be coming down. So that's definitely one area that we're currently avoiding and rather focusing on other parts of that consumer space where we still see growth. Alfredo Yonka, Client Portfolio Manager and Investment Specialist at Alfinity Investment Management here in Sydney. We do have more to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. The Australian government is appalled at this outcome. We will be commuting, communicating our response in the strongest terms. Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong there speaking after the Australian writer Yang Hongjin received a suspended death sentence in China after being convicted of spying. Uh, let's talk about the broader implications of this decision on ties between Australia and China. Bloomberg's Ben Westcott joins us now from Canberra. And Ben, of course, this relationship has only recently kind of started to thaw under the new government. Penny Wong is typically unflappable. You could kind of, you know, sense the, 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 the strength in that language language that was used yesterday reacting to this ruling. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, that was, I was in the room for that press conference. There was a real sense of whether some, some people have said shock, some people have said anger, but there was a real sense of the gravity of this moment uh, in, in her appearance there. Um, and it, there's no doubt that this will dramatically complicate the push by the centre-left Labor government in Australia to warm ties with China. Um, you know, there, there is a division on, on whether or not, you know, what this means, whether or not this is a decision targeted at the Australian government or whether this is an internal uh, political decision by the Chinese government, which doesn't really have much of a bearing on Australia ties. But either way, there is no doubt that this will complicate that push and, and throws into doubt, um, you know, things like the wine tariffs, which were expected to be removed within months, and the potential visit to Australia by the Chinese Premier or pro uh, President later this year. Australia isn't going to be recalling its ambassador from Beijing. What's the significance of that decision and how are they likely to, to continue to advocate for this, this case? Yeah, there was no doubt that if you compare the, the language that was used when Yang Heng Jun was arrested back in January 2019 and then, you know, was formally charged later that year, and then the language that has been used yesterday by Penny Wong, there is no doubt that Australia is still pursuing uh, its attempts to um, engage with China, mostly behind closed doors and keep the temperature reasonably cool in public. But even despite that, you know, to this morning we saw the Prime Minister use the word outrage we saw that images of the uh, Chinese ambassador being summoned to Canberra, uh, to not to Canberra, he lives in Canberra, to the uh, Defence and to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade yesterday. Um, even with that not wanting to turn up the temperature on the relationship any higher than it has to be, this is some strong, strong language from the Australian government that is clearly taken aback by this decision. Do we expect any further progress when it comes to this case? And I suppose contrasted with uh, the outcome that we had for the Australian journalist Cheng Lei, uh, how does the Australian government kind of proceed from here? Because clearly there's quite a, a screen of opacity, if you will, over how they reach this ruling and, and the determinants that went into it. Yeah, well, the next two years are a crucial time for young Heng Jun, the Australian writer now, because he is on a suspended death sentence. And as long as he, uh, you know, as long as in China's words, there are no serious crimes in those next two years, 
then he will receive a life sentence after that, uh, which is comparatively preferable. Um, but uh, but those two years will obviously be a, a really um, crucial time. Um, and so the Australian government's going to have to decide. And, and, and part of part of what happens next is based on whether or not um, this is what some analysts have called hostage diplomacy, whether uh, Yang's uh, sentence is a, is intended to send a message to Canberra or whether this is an internal Chinese matter. And, and if this is an internal Chinese government matter, maybe there is a very limited amount that the Australian government can really do at this stage. All right, that was our Australia government reporter, Ben Westcott, there in Canberra. Let's shift to Korea now because Samsung's executive chair, J.Y. Lee, has been acquitted of stock manipulation charges. That allows him to continue leading the conglomerate. It comes at a crucial time for Samsung as well amid a global slowdown and challenges from other tech firms. For more, our Asia Tech senior reporter, Yulim Lee, joins us. And Yulim, yeah, pretty shocking verdict. What exactly does it mean for Samsung? Yes, J.Y. Lee uh, was found not guilty of all the charges, including stock uh, manipulation. Um, this is this goes back to 2015 um, merger of the two units uh, that uh, the prosecutors said facilitated uh, his succession. The uh, the panel of judges yesterday at the Seoul court uh, said they could not conclude that uh, there were enough uh, evidence that this actually happened. So he's completely um, cleared. And this is a bit of a surprise to, to some people because uh, some people uh, expected that he would get suspended sentence. Um, but, you know, this is the a victory for him and the best possible outcome for Samsung, uh, you know, going forward. Um, Obviously, the company has been distracted uh, by this uh, whole legal proceedings. Uh, there had been more than 100 trials uh, related to this case, of which he attended, uh, J.Y. Lee himself, 95 uh, trials. So he had to sort of schedule his business trips around his trial uh, you know, dates. So it may not be quite obvious from outside, but it, uh, it's really paralyzed Samsung in a significant way. Um, you know, they had to make critical investment at the right time for the future, but uh, they instead have kind of uh, lost ground to uh, memory chip maker uh, rival SK Hynix uh, in terms of making advanced chips. And in smartphones, they lost market share too. Um, uh, Apple in the past year. So um, we expect with this verdict uh, to uh, Samsung to make a you know, bigger investment uh, going forward in critical areas such as AI and biotech going forward. And Yulim, JYD said, himself this, this uh, has to, uh, had to actually uh, uh, make, make himself more visible and uh, lead the company the way that he should have done in the past years. Right. And, uh, you know, as we've been saying, this is an extraordinarily good outcome for Samsung and maybe unexpected, right? Do you think it's an economic decision? Well, the, the analyst and the lawyers that we spoke to yesterday uh, certainly have that view. Um, it is, uh, it is true that Samsung is in a very difficult situation. It is the biggest company in, in the country that uh, has been really experiencing a huge slump in smartphones and, um, you know, semiconductor industries. So, you know, they, they think that there is some element to it. Our Asia Tech senior reporter, Yulim Lee, there. More to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. watching Daybreak Australia, just a couple of breaking headlines that are crossing the terminal right now. This is wages data that's coming out of Japan. So we saw it rising. Labor cash earnings up 1% on the year. The estimate actually had been for 1.4%. So you're falling short of that uh, estimate. That is also that, that reading 
was supposed to be a sort of temporary pickup as well because you had strong profits leading companies to boost their winter bonuses. So this is fairly weak data here. And that's also being really emphasised through the real cash earnings as well uh, that are dropping 1.9%. That's worse than what the survey had been expecting of 1.5% or negative 1.5%. So really, uh, these, these labor numbers, not a great signal for the health of the Japanese economy. And again, you've seen that reflected in household spending because it's in contractionary territory down 2.5% worse than what the estimate had been for a reduction of 0.2% flat. Uh, so, yeah, not great numbers. It tells us uh, that really it's saying the BOJ is going to be tracking quite closely because they want to see sustained wage gains before they start to, to exit away from their negative rates, Heidi. Take a look, uh, Bell, as to what we're tracking in terms of how this market open and uh, the cash trading session is progressing just half an hour into the start of trading here in Australia. We're seeing a little bit of further downside now when it comes to uh, stock trading. And of course, so much of this is reflected on kind of a, a bit of sidelining ahead of the RBA decision. Of course, no expectations uh, as to uh, a decision other than a whole, but so much more scrutiny when it comes to uh, the upgraded forecast, the economic forecast and inflation forecast as well as these expectations of when that first rate cut might come through. This is, of course, Bell, as we've been talking about, the first meeting of the year. We haven't heard from the RBA in a couple of months, but also the first under this revamped communications regime. Uh, it was a pretty torrid year for the RBA last year, and a lot of these reforms have uh, kicked off at the start of the new year, including that press conference in the afternoon today, Bell. Yeah, we're going to be tracking it very closely. We can actually get more on it now because we've got uh, the RBA, as you said, set to reveal its decision later today. The expectation is for a hold uh, at 4.35%. But let's discuss with our next guest, Joe Masters, Chief Economist at Baron Joey. And uh, Joe, Heidi just sort of ran through some of the changes that we've got today around communication and, and the press that follows these quarterly updates. What are you going to be watching for most closely out of this? Well, the press conference is probably the thing that we're looking forward to the most. Uh, we haven't had that in Australia. As you said in your intro, we haven't heard from the RBA for some time. And that's an opportunity for the governor to expand on the post-meeting statement to answer the questions coming from journalists. Uh, so that's the biggest change and the thing that we're looking at the most. As you said, though, there's a range of changes. So the other ones I would just highlight is that the post-meeting um, statement that announces uh, where policy is set and where it is going will come from the board and not from the governor. So a more consensus view, and this is part of this push to try to put the responsibility of policy changes onto the board rather than solely the governor. We'll also get the statement on monetary policy released at the same time as the rates announcement at 2.30. So it used to come on the Friday following. And that also has had a communication revamp. So there's a lot of uncertainty today about exactly what we're going to get. And there'll be a lot for economists to trawl through. As you said, though, no expectation of a change in rates. A lot of focus on forward guidance, though. And what do you think is the most likely scenario here? Do you think that the RBA is is set to push back on any expectations for cuts, keep that tightening bias just a little bit longer? I think it's a really close call. I think if you look at the economic data, we've had weak labour force, weak retail trade, uh, lower than expected inflation relative to the RBA's forecast, material miss. Uh, I think given those, uh, the data and given the RBA's own forecasts, they'll extend to mid-26 and we think they'll forecast core inflation at 2.7% at that point. Um, that you could argue they could soften that tightening bias a little bit. Perhaps the language will change to the assessment of the appropriate stance of monetary policy rather than the assessment of the need for further rate hikes. But look, I think it's a close call. They could well hold the tightening bias because they want to sit on market expectations, as you said, but also just mindful that uh, back last year when they paused in April, uh, we saw the housing market take off pretty quickly. And so maybe they just want to sit on top of that for a little bit longer too. The discrepancies between what the RBA is dealing with and the Fed, you know, does that also give them an argument that they could stay hawkish for longer, right? Because the cash rate is about, what, one percentage point below the Fed's, but the inflation is actually higher. 
actually think they have more room to move than the Fed. Uh, inflation is coming down faster than they expected. And we have very clear signs in Australia that the economy is slowing. And of course, that's not the case in the US. And that is critical for the outlook because to bring down that sticky inflation, you need spare capacity in the economy. Now, we can measure that in lots of ways, but one that I'll give you is that hours worked is falling faster than it did in the global financial crisis here in Australia. So the labour market is easing and economic activity is slowing. And that should give them a bit of confidence that inflation is coming down and that might actually be moderating faster than they thought. How important is it, and I suppose this is more of a markets question, for those updated forecasts to come immediately? How useful is that for you? Look, as an economist, it's just a lot of information at one time. But I think on balance, <laughs> it is uh, helpful than rather waiting for a few days. So in the past, we've had the statement that's had some high level uh, indications of where their forecasts are going, but not the complete set. And it's left economists trying to work out perhaps some of the nuances in the statement relative to what may be coming a few days later. So on balance, I think it's uh, going to be easier to get all of the information. And of course, for the media, they'll have those forecasts before they get the opportunity to ask the governor questions. What do you see when it comes to the Aussie dollar, which is coming under renewed pressure now? Even if we get a bit of a lift from a hawkish tone from Governor Bullock, do you think ultimately there are still more downsides for the Aussie dollar given the, tra the trajectory of China's economy and given potential repricing uh, that leads to a higher greenback? Yeah, so definitely the trajectory for the US dollar has been absolutely critical. That's arguably been the driving force for the currency. If we look back at 2023, the Aussie dollar had a mixed performance against our other trading partners, but clearly very weak against the US dollar. So I think that US dollar story is important. Um, and clearly China uh, having an impact um, as we move forward on sentiment, but also kind of on the economic outlook. And of course, a weak China raises the prospects that you would actually start perhaps to cut rates a little earlier than you would have done otherwise here in Australia. So there are certainly some pressures. Um, we also still have a current account surplus, and that's an unusual position for Australia. And at Baron Joey, we expect that current account surplus to last for some time. So, look, certainly I think you could see some weakness on the day um, following the RBA, um, some volatility perhaps around the press conference as we hear from the governor and, and try to dissect what she's saying. Um, if we look further forward, though, I guess our fair value modelling tells us that fair value can slowly drift up towards 70 cents uh, over the next 12 months, helped in part by a fading US dollar, um, helped in part by a narrowing of interest rate differentials. What else has changed over the last couple of months perhaps is, is the, the fortunes for the Albanese government because there's a lot of pressure on, on the Prime Minister to ease the, the burden of the cost of living pressures and something that's coming out of this is this stage three tax tweaks to try and boost low income spending. Do you see that having any sort of bearing on the policy direction for the RBA? So on the redesign of the stage three tax cuts, uh, what I find is a lot of people are comparing what the new redesign relative to no change. But actually, we already had tax cuts in our forecast, as did the RBA, as did pretty much all forecasters. So the redesign is really about the redistribution. We estimate it puts about $5 billion into consumption over and above what the already legislated tax cuts would have done. To put that in context, household spending in Australia is $1.3 trillion a year. So it does give us a little bit of a lift to consumption, but not enough to change our view materially around inflation or indeed around the RBA. Having said that, it seems quite clear, and the Treasurer talked about this last night, that they are still looking for additional cost of living relief. So that could be an extension of the electricity subsidies. That could be another material lift in rental subsidies. Um, I'm sure they're casting the net very wide. They are clearly, though, putting an inflation lens on it. So they're trying to help everyday Australians, but not make the inflation problem too uh, much worse. Joe, always great to have you with us, especially on RBA Day. Joe Masters, Chief Economist at Baron Joey, as we count down to that decision. Uh, 2.30 Sydney time is when we get the announcement. Turning to the Fed and Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby says he'd like to see more favourable US inflation data before interest rate reductions can begin. But speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, he said he wouldn't rule out a potential cut in March.
it feels like the economy's been quite strong on the growth front. You got big jobs numbers, you got big GDP numbers better than expected. But at the same time, we've had inflation better than expected, too. If you look over the last seven months, we've had seven months of really quite good inflation reports right around or even below the Fed's target. So if we just keep getting more data like what we have gotten, we're well on the, uh, I believe that we should be well be on the path to normalization. Well, I understand you don't want to tie yourself down, but is there really much of a chance of a March move? The markets think now 18 percent, and some people think that's even high. Well, look, Michael, as I say, all, all we need to do is keep getting information like what we've been getting for the last seven months, where inflation on a flow basis is absolutely under control and is, is in the range of, of our Fed target. Uh, and if we keep getting strong quantity numbers, that is to say jobs numbers, GDP numbers, growth numbers, while inflation goes down, in the conventional view, that's not really supposed to happen. So that would, we, we'd have to be entertaining the possibility that we're entering a period like the mid to late 90s where you had productivity growth faster than, than expected, faster than trend, and, th and that opens up some new possibilities. Scott Pelley of CBS last night said that Powell suggested that rate cuts would likely be a quarter, maybe a half of a percentage point at a time. That doesn't appear in the transcript. Was a half percentage point cut discussed at the meeting? Um, as you know, we, we don't report on what's discussed at the meeting until the transcript comes out. The, the, our standard way to think of it uh, from the FOMC is somewhat like what's in the summary of, of economic projections, the SEP, which comes out every quarter. And the last time that came out in December, you saw that the median member of the FOMC thought there would be three rate cuts, i.e. 75 basis points for the year 2024. Is there a situation other than perhaps a recession or some sort of market failure where you would consider a 50 basis point cut? Well, look, I, I just think we, you get the data and, and you respond to the data uh, uh, in its totality. So uh, it's, I, I don't think it makes sense to speculate about hypotheticals of what would happen to make the rate cuts be different than what they have been in the past. That was the Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Mike McKee. Uh, that's the latest stories now from around the world. Let's get to these ones. Israel's foreign minister says time is running out to find a diplomatic solution to the presence of Hezbollah fighters along its border with Lebanon. Israeli forces have exchanged fire with the militant group almost every day since the Hamas attacks of October 7. Israel has said it's prepared to open another war front if Hezbollah doesn't retreat from the border under the terms of a long-standing UN resolution. Donald Trump and House Republican leaders have slammed a bipartisan Senate deal to impose new U.S. border restrictions and unlock billions of dollars in Ukraine aid. Trump used a social media post to call it a death wish for the Republican Party. Speaker Mike Johnson says the Senate compromise is dead on arrival in the House. The deal to crack down on illegal border crossings also includes $60 billion for Ukraine. Britain's King Charles is receiving treatment for an unspecified form of cancer, a new health scare for the royal family less than 18 months since the death of Queen Elizabeth. The cancer was discovered during the King's recent treatment for a benign prostate condition. Buckingham Palace says Charles has suspended public duties but will continue state business and official paperwork. Watch us live and see our past interviews on our interactive TV function, TV Go. There you can also dive into any of the securities or Bloomberg functions we talk about. Plus, become part of the conversation by sending us instant messages during our shows. This is for Bloomberg subscribers only. Check it out at TV Go.
Global investment in the energy transition soared 17% last year to a record $1.8 trillion. Bloomberg NEF data also showing that spending on electrified transport overtaking renewable energy investment for the first time. BNEF's APAC head Ali Azadi joins us now to break down those numbers. So, uh, interesting takeaways. What are we seeing for 2024? So in terms of regional order, we are likely going to see similar trends this year. Um, so we expect as a block, uh, Asia Pacific to continue to remain the, the largest market for uh, energy transition investment. Uh, even though the growth rate in Asia Pacific is certainly this year is also going to be lower than uh, what we're going to see in the Americas as well as the Europe, Middle East and uh, Africa region. Within the countries, we may also see this year for the first time India surpassing Japan. Uh, it already came very within close distance of doing that uh, in 2023. On a sectoral level, um, so in 2023, the highest growth rates uh, in Asia Pacific were for clean hydrogen and storage sectors. That's likely to continue this year as we see a significant amount of projects in the pipeline. Um, in APAC, uh, investment in renewable energy in 2023 was slightly still larger than electrified transport. We very, very likely see that change this year um, as we see more momentum for uh, the electric vehicle market in the region. Even though the EV market in China has slowed down, uh, still positive growth, and we're seeing significant growth in new emerging EV markets in the region, particularly in India and Southeast Asia. So with all of those different investments in mind, Ali, do you think that we're on track then to meet the, the Paris climate goals? So it's a bit of a mixed picture. Uh, let's start with the good news first. If you look at investment in uh, supply chains for energy transition technologies, actually the annual investment is running ahead of uh, what our uh, Paris Agreement Alliance scenario requires. Now that masks a little bit of details in the sense that some sectors, uh, such as investment in supply chains for solar, batteries, and EVs, are running ahead of uh, what, what is required, while others, in particular wind, are lagging behind. Then if you look at the investment required for deployment of the technologies by market, uh, that $1.77 trillion that got invested in 2023, that number would have to be running globally at an annual average of about three times for the remainder of this decade. If you look at it by market, for example, for China, we would have to see the annual investment rate to more than double uh, on average for the rest of this decade. For Japan, that would have to be more than six times, and for India, more than nine times. Um, these are really, really uh, rapid growth rates that would be required to be aligned. Um, there's enough pool of money available, but we would have to see a lot more public and private collaboration and much more multilateral collaboration, which on the latter, unfortunately, with a lot of political uncertainty this year, it's unlikely that we're going to see uh, happen in the short term. All right, that was Bloomberg NEF head of APAC Research, Ali Azadi in Goa in India there. And uh, Heidi, we will have more ahead on, on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. The top corporate stories today, shares in Palantir jumped in late trading as it reported a first annual profit. The software and analysis company also gave a better than expected outlook for 2024, citing strong demand linked to artificial intelligence. Income and revenue for 2023 both beating expectations, with management saying they're rebuilding the company to meet AI demand. Bloomberg has learned that Reddit's revenue for 2023 rose 20% as it prepares for one of the most anticipated IPOs in the US. A source says it made a profit in the fourth quarter, but not across the full year. We're told that the social media platform is telling investors that revenue topped $800 million last year, Bell. And Heidi, a very significant step really for South Korea on Tuesday because it's kicking off a test run of extended trading hours for its currency. What it wants to do is try and attract more inflows and improve the market's accessibility. The test date has actually been more, moved forward by more than a week, that's to today, to secure enough time for a review. So let's get more from our FX and rate strategist David Finity. Yeah, pretty significant step here trying to... to extend the trading hours and, and, and improve the accessibility. 
Yeah, certainly it's a, pretty much a major step, really, for the one. At the moment, if the on, it's all to do with onshore trading. That's the key thing. At the moment, the onshore hours are just basically from 9 a.m. so to 3.30, so pretty limited in the space of the FX world, which is really 24 hours. So really, the goal is by July to extend that to 2 a.m., so quite a drastic change. And obviously, the whole idea behind this, obviously, is ever to increase that liquidity and make the one more attractive, which could have a repercussion of it being uh, helping the Korean bonds being added to the FTSE World Bond Index, which could increase inflows of up to 70 billion a year, it is estimated. Now, having said this, it has to be remembered, while the rules are being expanded, it is going to be the one basically being traded onshore against the dollar and the yuan. Those are the only two currencies, and they said it's not related to offshore trading. But it will actually help companies if on the onshore market, because at the moment it said, if you want to trade the one on the offshore, really you're doing the NDFs. And then given the limited time that the one is, is open on the onshore market, for a lot of companies, certainly foreign investors, you know, it's not the most easiest or most attractive currency to trade. So the expansion of the hours will definitely help. Are we expecting to see a big boost in volumes? And as you say, are we expected to see more, more foreign traders in the interbank market through this? Yeah, I think certainly with State Street Bank and Trust, they've already joined into the local interbank market because really that's what foreign institutions will be joining if they wish to. There are rules they have to do with, with by set up credit lines with 10 financial institutions. But the, the idea is obviously that it will spur, hopefully spur more foreign investors to partake in the interbank market, which obviously would increase liquidity, particularly with the extended hours. And I said one big thing alone, if it does impact the inclusion of uh, Korean bonds being in joining the FTSE um, World Government Bond Index, then that's a big one, big win for the one it will be. Because I said, estimated flows per year uh, could be as big as 70 billion. So that by alone will obviously see quite a big um, increase in liquidity. Our FX and rates strategist David Finity there with the latest. And coming up in the next hour of Daybreak, Oriana Financial Services tells us why they think government bonds can deliver solid returns in the near term. We'll also take a closer look at the acquittal of Samsung Executive Chairman J.Y. Lee and the implications for the company.